Welcome back to the series of lectures on Henry George, Karl Marx, and their followers, a century of sometimes intense rivalry. This is the second lecture in the series. A part of the world where Henry George's proposed solution to land rent monopoly found the most concrete support was in Australia. Even before anyone had heard of Henry George, public pressure for an end to the private appropriation of land's rental value had become part of the public dialogue in Australia, while socialists at the same time embraced land nationalization. A report on the public alliance of single taxers with socialists in Australia was provided by one W.M. Truebridge in the autumn 1905 issue of the Single Tax Review. He said, we have many able single taxers in our federal and state houses who have thrown in their lot with the Labor Party, socialist though it is, sooner than join with the conservative keep things as they are crowd. A member of the Socialist League of New South Wales, A.G. Ewan, responded in January of 1890 to an editorial in the Daily Telegraph of Sydney by single taxer John Farrell on what Farrell argued were the limits of trade unionism and socialism. He writes, after a lengthy preamble as to what socialism is not, Mr. Farrell delivers himself in this wise. Between the proposals of socialism and what the single tax seeks to effect, there is a difference of principle absolute and not to be compromised. This is undoubtedly true, for the taxation of land values is not and cannot be socialism in any sense of the word. Socialism is the proposed extinction of capitalism, and not alone the proposed change of the form of society because we desire it, but the inevitable development of human society from the struggle of existence to the conscious control of the means of subsistence. Even before Henry George's writings reached the European continent, the principles of cooperative individualism were already established in Denmark. There, the power of the landed aristocracy had been greatly reduced by land reform measures that enabled the establishment of many independent, family-owned farms. A system of Danish people's high schools provided a different sort of educational experience for Denmark's young people, and many of the teachers of these schools were quick to embrace and then teach from the writings of Henry George, as described in 1923 by Mrs. Signa Borner in an address delivered at an international conference held in England. She stated, the aim of the high school is to open the doors and windows of mind and spirit so that the pupils may find whatever help there is to be had and be able to go into the world and work out their own salvation, each in his own way. Needless to say, many of our high school teachers are connected with the Henry George movement. After discovering the writings of Henry George, Leo Tolstoy became convinced that only the adoption of George's systemic reforms would stave off the coming upheaval and chaos that took Russians down the path of state socialism and the Stalinist dictatorship. Tolstoy wrote the preface to the Russian language edition of George's book Social Problems, proclaiming, Henry George's scheme which overturns the whole order of life of the nations for the benefit of the crushed, voiceless majority and to the prejudice of the ruling minority, is set forth with such convincing and irrefutable arguments, and above all, so simply, that it is impossible not to understand it. And having once understood, one cannot help trying to carry it into effect. Therefore, there is but one remedy against it, and that is to misrepresent it or to ignore it. When George was again lecturing in Britain during 1885, he shared the stage with socialist leader Henry M. Hindman for a long and penetrating exchange. In this debate, George challenged the socialist analysis of how the world works. 
He stated, It seems to me that you socialists confuse yourselves by using terms in varying senses. Here we are discussing the relations of capital and land, the inference necessarily being that they are separate things, whereas you include land as capital and also include as capital such things as monopoly and competition. Land is not merely one of the means of production, but the natural factor in all production, the field and material upon which alone human labor can be exerted. Hinman considered George's argument and in part responded. The capitalist system of production involves class monopoly of the means of production and competition among property-less wage earners. As to the competition between capital and capitalists, that is going on most fiercely today. The result always is that in the long run, the capitalist class as a whole gets a greater relative proportion of the products of labor and the working class a less relative proportion. The same would be the case if the land were nationalized, the other conditions remaining unchanged. But Hinman either misunderstood or was misrepresenting George. George was not arguing for the nationalization of land. This, he argued, was unnecessary. The deeds to land could remain in private hands so long as the rent of land did not. George argued that all producers owed to society the full rent and no more, derived from their control of locations and what he described as, quote, natural monopolies. This involved essentially any asset that had a fixed or inelastic supply. The amount of rent may be great or minimal as determined by market forces and based on natural advantages or advantages associated with the public goods and services brought to a location. However, once the full rent was publicly captured, the financial obligation of the individual to society was fulfilled. As he responded to Hindman, It seems to me the difference between us is this. We both agree that labor does not find its proper opportunities to get its fair reward. Your contention is that, to remedy this state of things, not merely land but also capital must be made common property. Well, I contend that it is only necessary to make common property of that to which natural rights are clearly equal and without which men cannot exist or produce land. Back home in the United States, George accepted the nomination of New York City's labor leaders to run for the office of mayor of the city. George's candidacy brought to labor more votes than ever before, although he ended up in second place behind the Tammany Hall candidate Abram Hewitt. The Republican Party candidate Theodore Roosevelt came in third. After the election, George had second thoughts about a political alliance with socialists within the United Labor Party. In the 6 August 1887 issue of his newspaper, The Standard, George stated his position. There are a large number of us who are not socialists, do not propose to become socialists, and are not willing to be used as a stocking horse for socialism. In October of that year, George sat down to debate the socialist editor of the New York German language socialist newspaper, Sergei Shevich, in New York City's minor theater. What bothered Shevich was that, in his opinion, if George's scheme became law, the existing concentration of income and wealth, the existing concentration of ownership of the means of production would remain and remain, he believed, undisturbed. The consequences would be quite the opposite of what Henry George believed they would be. He said, The single land tax would be a single tax. All other taxes would be abolished. The tremendous concentration of capital would be entirely free of any taxes at all. It would mean absolutely free trade. American labor would have to compete with the combined force of capital all over the civilized world. If you introduce absolute free trade, dozens of branches of industry would drop and die. Thousands and thousands of working men would be thrown out of employment. 
a commercial crisis would be the consequence such as we have never seen in this country. The labor market would be overcrowded. What would we do with free land then? Sit on it or lie on it or be tramps upon it? Land without the instruments or labor to cultivate it is just as worthless as a boat without sails. George asked socialists to look more deeply at what would certainly occur if land prices fell to zero as land rent was fully captured by society and labor was then able to fully keep the wages earned. The trouble with socialism is its superficiality. A socialistic view is the view of industrial relations as they appear on the surface in those centers where they have assumed their most complex and most highly developed form. The prominence into which the finished processes of industry are brought obscures the absolute dependence of man and all his works on Mother Earth. We can abolish all other taxes and enormously simplify government. Opening opportunities for labor, we can get rid of that bitter competition that today everywhere tends to force wages down. Then we can go on, not a paternal government that attempts to regulate everything, but to a government that controls businesses in their natural monopolies. In London, once again in 1889, George and Henry Hindman met for another debate at St. James Hall on the 2nd of July. Hinneman referred to himself as a radical social democrat and in agreement with George that the rent of land should be confiscated, but that this was not going far enough. I am not here under any circumstances whatever to defend the landlord, but want to get at him, not merely to confiscate rent, but to take the land for the people and to organize production upon the soil. George offered what was by now a standard response. What we aim at is not so much the taking of rent for the use of the community as freeing the land for the use of labor. Mr. Hinman says that if rent were taken and taxes abolished, the laborers would be knocking at the factory gates and the gates of the dockyards as they do now. They would not. With taxes on land values, with taxes on economic rent from land, whether it was vacant land or the site of a factory or pleasure ground or farm, we compel all over this country the dogs in the manger to let go their grasp. It would give opportunities by which labor could employ itself. To a significant extent, a Georgia system of public revenue would provide a strong financial incentive for those who controlled land to bring the land they held to its highest best use or sell to someone who would. Still, there were in the world many extremely wealthy individuals and business enterprises who could well afford to meet their financial obligation and pay whatever rent was due and still hold on to vast acreages of land for years decades or longer. By now, Henry George's campaign was being referred to by many proponents as the call for the single tax, that is, the elimination of all taxation except for an annual charge to all who held land, the charge to be equal to the potential annual rental value of whatever land was held. A staunch supporter of the single tax, Arch MacDonald, added his voice to the ongoing debate with socialists in the August 1897 issue of the movement's main organ, The Single Tax. MacDonald wrote, State socialism, with its nationalization of the land, the means of production, distribution, and exchange, could not abolish slavery because it is based on robbery, and robbery is the essence of slavery. It would only replace the present pseudo-owners by owners having the same human nature and with extended powers of evil and tyrannical disposition, the effect of which would by far transcend the evil influence of present landlordism. In 1893, leading single taxers came together in Chicago for a national conference. 
Already, many of these individuals were politically active. In the United States, a single tax party had been formed in 1890 that would continue putting up candidates for public office through the 1928 presidential election, although the decision was made in 1924 to change the party name to the Commonwealth Land Party. Called upon once more by his supporters and working people to stand for election to the office of mayor of New York City in 1897, George accepted, although warned the stress of the campaign was almost certain to cause his death. A few days before George actually collapsed giving a campaign address, the New York Times printed mischaracterizations of George that elicited a detailed response by one of George's strongest supporters, attorney Thomas G. Sherman. Not a single criticism has proceeded from any genuine workingman. On the one hand, far too much has been said by respectable newspapers and respectable men as to Mr. George's supposed anarchistic and socialistic tendencies. Mr. George is as far removed from being socialist as Mr. Seth Lowe or Mr. Benjamin Tracy. In fact, he is less a socialist than either of those gentlemen because both of them are in favor of some kind of protectionism, which is necessarily socialism, only for the benefit of the rich. Seth Lowe and Benjamin Tracy were key political figures in Brooklyn, New York. From 1890 to 1901, Lowe served as president of Columbia College. Tracy, a former Secretary of the Navy, had run for mayor of New York City in 1897, one of his opponents being Henry George Jr., who agreed to stand for election following his father's collapse. No one individual stepped into the leadership position of the single tax movement after the death of Henry George. A diverse group of figures emerged to take on the job of keeping their message in front of the public. In the United States, the most prominent of this group were Louis F. Post, Tom L. Johnson, and Thomas Shearman. Louis F. Post would eventually serve in the Wilson administration as an assistant secretary of labor. By his mid-twenties, he had a successful law practice in New York City. He was an early advisor to Henry George, served as president of the Manhattan Single Tax Club, and as editor of Henry George's newspaper, The Standard. Then, in 1898, he founded the weekly newspaper, The Public, which not only continued to promote Henry George's system of political economy, but also became an outspoken critic of what Post viewed as American imperialism against the peoples of the Philippines, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Hawaiian Islands. Tom L. Johnson had become wealthy in the street railway business, eventually purchasing controlling interests in the railways of several Midwestern cities. Introduced to Henry George's writings in the early 1880s, Johnson sought out George and offered to help. In 1890, he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives by voters in Cleveland, Ohio. After serving two terms, he returned to Cleveland and ran for and was elected mayor in 1901. Johnson is considered by economic historians as one of the best mayors ever to serve a large U.S. city. That year in Cleveland, a young progressive attorney named Frederick C. Howe came under Tom Johnson's spell. Howe and several others came to comprise Johnson's inner circle. In the process of coming to understand city politics, Howe had to overcome his earlier education in political science at John Hopkins University. He later wrote, I learned about socialism, but it did not interest me. It was not believed in by the men I knew. I read Henry George, but the single tax seemed altogether too easy a reform to be taken as a social philosophy, nor was it believed in by my professors. In his autobiography, titled The Confessions of a Reformer, Howe described the 10-year struggle by Tom Johnson to turn Cleveland into an honestly and efficiently governed city. To the young men in the movement, 
and to tens of thousands of the poor who gave their support, it was a moral crusade rarely paralleled in American politics. The struggle involved the banks, the press, the Chamber of Commerce, the clubs, and the social life of the city. It divided families and destroyed friendships. You were either for Tom Johnson or against him. If for him, you were a disturber of business, a socialist, to some an anarchist, every other political issue and almost every topic of conversation was subordinated to the struggle. How would, in 1914, be called upon by Woodrow Wilson to serve as United States Commissioner of Immigration at Ellis Island in New York? He set about instituting major reforms and improvements in the conditions provided to the newly arrived peoples from so many different countries. At war's end, Howe joined the U.S. peace mission in Paris. He came away cynical about the future. The world was ruled by the exploiting class that ruled in the interest of the things it owned. Tories and liberals, landlords and capitalists all looked upon the political state as did the spoilsmen. It was a thing to give them private gain. Shortly after returning to the United States, Howe submitted his letter of resignation to Woodrow Wilson. After deep reflection, he concluded that the kind of systemic changes he embraced would come only from the laboring class. He helped to start a weekly paper called Labor, taking charge of the paper's editorial writing. A new system of worker cooperation emerged, not socialism, not dependence on a powerful state, but social and economic organization that, quote, achieved all the ends that socialism promised and left the individual free from bureaucratic control. Also lending his family name and reputation to the single tax cause was William Lloyd Garrison, Jr., son of the great anti-slavery campaigner. At a public meeting in 1903, Garrison gave a talk titled, The Real Enemy of Labor. Echoing Henry George, he urged his audience to consider landed privilege as the problem faced by workers. The greatest and most injurious privilege is land monopoly, that is, the power to withhold from use desirable land, thereby decreasing the field of labor. From this power springs the common confusion that land is capital. It cannot be too strongly asserted that land is the source of capital and not a part of it. Soon thereafter came the book by Max Hirsch, Democracy Versus Socialism, published in London. Born in Germany, Hirsch embarked on a business career that eventually took him to Australia, where he became a founding member of the Victorian Single Tax League. Hirsch echoed George's call for voluntary cooperation, for embracing the principles of cooperative individualism. In his view, socialism conflicted with the natural desires of human beings. He writes, One of the claims most frequently and passionately urged by modern socialists is that their system has emerged from the empirical stage and has become scientific. Nevertheless, this claim appears to be unfounded. Knowledge becomes science through the systematic arrangement of the natural laws by which a group or groups of related facts or phenomena are governed, and in their interpretation through causal connection, so that from that which is observable, conclusions can be formed with regard to that which is not observable. Any system which applies such natural laws to man's needs is a system based on science, that is, scientific. Likewise, any system of politics will be scientific if it is based on well-ascertained natural laws governing the conduct of men in society. But if any political system is not based on such natural laws, still more if it is based on the express denial of the existence of such laws, it cannot be scientific. It is mere empirical conception. This is the position of socialism. A review of Hirsch's book by Sidney Ball, 
a fellow at St. John's College, Oxford, and member of the Fabian Society, in the Economic Journal, took Hirsch to task for failing to acknowledge that there were many socialist schemes beyond that offered by Karl Marx and embraced by his followers. Our author is scarcely justified in discounting the modifications to which not only socialism generally, but even Marxian socialism, has been subject in recent years. Socialism loses nothing of its integrity by being presented not so much as a finished scheme or system of society, but as a principle or regulative idea of social reform. Debates between single taxers and socialist leaders continued. On 20 December 1903 in Chicago, Louis F. Post, Henry H. Hardinge, and John Z. White defended the single tax against Ernest Unterman, Seymour Stedman, and A. M. Simmons. Ernest Unterman, a member of the Socialist Party of America, had emigrated to the United States from Prussia in the early 1890s. He opened the debate with a long historical survey. Unterman would begin the first English translation of Marx's Das Kapital in 1905. On the question of the single tax, he stated, Before the modern single taxer ever thought of the single tax, the socialist had already analyzed it and rejected it as absolutely inadequate. Equipped with the Marxian philosophy of history, we are at once enabled to point out why former reforms were futile and failed, and why the single tax is inadequate to meet the present problem. The single tax response came first from Louis F. Post, now editor of The Public. Rather than trying to convince socialists their prescription for reform was inadequate, Post directed his comments to the working classes generally. At the end of his comments, he said, Let me ask you men and women of the working classes to consider this. A single tax will begin to yield its benefits step by step from the very start. The very moment that you abolish taxation of personal property, you will begin to get some of its benefits. The moment you abolish taxation of products of labor generally, you will get more. The moment you turn a larger part of the rent of land into the public treasury, you will get more. Make it progressive and you get the benefit progressively all the way from the beginning. But with socialism, you first have got to win an election, and you have got to hold your power, and you have got to change the old order. You have got to abolish the existing condition of things, root and branch. You do not begin to get any benefit when whatever under socialism until you have done all that. The next speaker on behalf of socialism was attorney Seymour Stedman, who attempted a point-by-point -point rebuttal of Louis F. Post. Curiously, the Wikipedia profile of Mr. Stedman states that he later became an adherent of the single tax system. However, during the 1890s, Stedman was a leading figure in the Social Democratic Party of America. Responding, Henry Hardinge, a mechanical engineer based in Chicago, talked about how best to deal with trusts and monopolies. Then he went to the heart of the means by which civilization might advance. Harding stated, We want cooperation, so do you, and we know how to get it. We want it to be voluntary and universal. We know that men cooperate because it is natural and necessary because men seek to gratify their desires with the least exertion. And if you remove the trinity of burdens, prohibitive land values and taxes upon production and exchange, you will at once make production perfect, unlimited and universal. And the moment you do that, you will have the free industrial system that the world today is looking forward to. John Z. White was just beginning years of extensive lecture tours and writing on behalf of the single tax. When it came time for him to make the final statement, he asked the audience to think clearly about what had and had not changed 
as the productive powers of capital goods were increasingly employed. I simply want to challenge the assertion that the middle class have ever got rid of the ancient aristocracy. It is not true. The ancient aristocracy is now in control today as in the ancient time. It is the landed interest, no matter in what guise, that dominates the economic situation everywhere. What he meant was that landlordism continued to exist as the basis of societal organization. What had once been agrarian landlordism changed to incorporate commercial agriculture. Industrial production put huge areas of land in the hands of privately owned businesses, as did the growth of urban centers. What socialists condemned as capitalism, white and other single taxers argued, was a system of agrarian, commercial, industrial, urban, and financial landlordism. And with that, we'll end here with lecture two.